All right, let's take a look at our lesson for today. So today we're going to be looking at polynomial and rational inequalities. So for polynomials, I want to kind of remind you about a lesson that we had last year. This is from our Algebra 2 Honors Notes. Just kind of, kind of remind you about end behavior and how polynomials behave when you graph them. Um, as you can see, and I put this up here for your reference so that you can look at it. It's uh, over to the side. As you can see, if the degree is odd, then um, the end behavior is different. And if the leading coefficient is positive, you start down and end up. If the leading coefficient is negative, you start up and end down. For even, the degrees that are even, the end behavior is the same. So if the leading coefficient is positive, you would start up and end up. And if the leading coefficient is negative, you would start up and end down. That's just a little bit of a review from uh, last year. And up here showing you how do you determine the degree. If the equation is in standard form, you just choose the largest exponent. If the equation is in factored form, you would actually have to add the degrees of each of the factors to determine what the degree of the whole function is. So that's just a little short little review. So let's take a look. We're going to um, solve polynomials both graphically and algebraically. Then we will solve rational inequalities both graphically and algebraically. So we're going to practice both of them with both techniques. So what does it mean to solve the inequality graphically? That means that they want you to graph this, this portion right here. They want you to graph that. And then they want you to figure out where it, are the y values greater than zero. That's our whole process. So let's take a look. Let's graph. So let's see, we have a zero at negative three. So there's a point right here. We have a zero at one, so there's a point right here. So let's calculate our degree. The degree would be one plus two or three, so it would be odd. The leading coefficient is, if I were to multiply all of that out, what would my x cubed um, term have in front of it? And we can see from here, so those are 1x and 1x, that it would just be positive. It's just a positive number. So the leading coefficient is positive. Okay, so let's see, what does that mean? If the degree is odd, that means our end behaviors are opposite. If the leading coefficient is negative, that means, excuse me, is positive, that means we end up Okay, so we're, we're getting you know, these clues here. Hopefully you remember about the cut-throughs if, if our factor, so this is called a factor, if our factor is to the first power, we have what's called a cut-through. That's what we called it last year. That means you just go right through the zero. That's what that means. If the factor is squared, then this is called a bounce which means we would just bounce off of it, like kind of like a quadratic, like a parabola. And then, just as a reminder, if the factor is cubed, we would have, um, we, we call flatten, if you will. It kind of looks like that. That's a, this would be for a cubed, if the factor is cubed. Like for example, you know, x minus five cubed. So then at, you know, five, it would come up and it would kind of flatten right at five and keep going up. So those are the three kinds of behavior that you can expect when you're graphing polynomials. All right, so we're gonna end up, which means we start down. Okay, so we're gonna start down, we're gonna come up, and then at one, it's a bounce, so, we're going to bounce right off, and there's our graph. 
So what we're looking for, what they want is for the Y values to be positive. So basically we're looking up here. We're looking um, where Y would be positive. That's going to be our answers. And we write our answer in interval notation. And actually, strangely enough, we are trying to figure out what the Y value is, whether it's positive or negative, but our answer is X values. So this part is talking about Y values, but the answer I'm getting ready to write is in terms of X values. So where does this positive start? It starts at negative three and it goes to one. Now I can't really include one because up here, this is greater than, not greater than or equal to. If it were greater than or equal to, then I could include the one and, and it would look a bit different. But since it's not, I would just have to piece them together with one of those union symbols. And then we would go one to infinity. And so these are the X intervals where our Y values are positive. Okay, so that's an example of a polynomial inequality done graphically. And you'll have some of each kind in your homework. So let's take a look at then working a polynomial algebraically. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have, so let's just make a note, a note. Okay, our note is we want a zero on one side of the inequality. Okay, it needs to be a zero. It's not okay if it's a three or a five or whatever. We, it's gotta be a zero. And as you can see right now, it's not a zero. Um, I've got X's on both sides of the inequality. So I'm going to subtract an X over. So it gives me X to the fourth minus X is greater than zero. All right, now the way that we solve algebraically is we factor. So let's, you know how I like steps. Let's write out our steps. So step one, get zero on one side. Step two would be to factor. Okay, so we're going to factor. So I pull out a greatest common factor, which is an X. That leaves me X cubed minus one. Okay, so hopefully we recognize X cubed minus one is the difference of perfect cubes. Oh yeah, there they are. Oh, isn't that exciting? We get to use that formula again? And you're like, sure, I remember that formula. I know exactly what you're talking about, Dr. Wright. But I don't know, maybe we don't. So I'll just give you a little reminder. If it's A cubed minus B cubed, we would factor that as A minus B a squared plus AB plus B squared. Okay, so that's how we would factor the difference of perfect cubes. Goodness, I can't write. The sum of perfect cubes would look almost exactly the same. That would be A plus B times A squared minus AB plus B squared. Okay, so there's just a little blast from the past. So here we go. So I've got X, my factoring for X cubed. So A would be X and B would be one. So I'm gonna have X minus one times X squared plus X plus one. And that has to be bigger than zero. Okay, so we factor. Step three, we want to place the zeros on a number line. Okay, great. Um, so let's see, x equals zero, x equals one. Those look good. If you're not trusting of this one, um, the factoring pattern of difference and sum of cubes, that piece, that quadratic never factors ever. And most of the time it's imaginary. So if you wanted to check out to see, you know, well, 
Is that a imaginary, are those imaginary zeros or are those zeros that are like radicals, like plus or minus square root of two or something weird? Um, you could check the determinant. If you recall, the determinant is the thing under the radical, the b squared minus four ac. If that number, so just this part underneath here, if that part underneath there is negative, we know that the solution is imaginary. So let's check that out. So it would be b is 1, so 1 squared minus 4 times 1 times 1. Oh yeah, that's a negative number, right? That's going to be a negative 3. So there, there are no real solutions for that, so we don't really need to worry about it. So we're just going to place the actual zeros on the number line. And we said there was 0 and 1. And now what we're going to do, our fourth step, is to check the intervals on the number line. Okay, what does that mean? This is called sign analysis. Put this in parentheses. This is called sign analysis. Maybe you remember from last year, maybe you don't. What do we do? I just pick a number. So, for example, you know, maybe I pick a negative one for this section, and maybe I pick a one half for that section, and maybe a two. It doesn't matter which number you pick, as long as the number is inside of the section. That's the criteria. The number has to be inside of the section. So what I do with these numbers, what do I do? What I do is I put this number into, um, and actually you could choose any one of those. You could, whichever one you like. I mean, you could put it in this one if you wanted to, or this one, or this one. Um, whichever one you think is easiest. It doesn't matter since x to the fourth minus x is, you know, quite a bit smaller, um, the non-factored one, I'm actually going to place those numbers in there. And so if I put a negative one here, negative one to the fourth is what? One minus negative one. So one plus one is two. So this section is positive. So any number from that section that I put into the equation is going to give me a positive number. Again, this is called sign analysis. So now I put in a half. I guess I can do a little scratch work down here. So we've got a half to the fourth minus a half. So let's see, a half times a half is one fourth. I don't know, that'd be what, one sixteenth minus a half. Okay, that, I know that was weird, but that's definitely going to be negative, right? Because 1 16th is positive and 1 half is negative, so that's going to be negative. And it doesn't matter what number, I could have put a fourth or three fourths, any number in between 0 and 1 would have given me a negative value. Actually, a negative y value. We're still testing y values. So lastly, let's use a 2. So let's see, 2 to the fourth, that's pretty big, isn't it? 2 to the fourth minus two, so two times two is four, four times two is eight, so is that 16 minus two? That, that's a positive number. And so there are our signs. We have our signs that are listed here. So we can see we want, what do we want? We want to be bigger than zero, that's what we want. So we look at these sections, there's three sections. Which sections are bigger than zero? Hmm. Positive is bigger than zero. Positive is bigger than zero. So that's our answers. Again, our answers we're going to write in interval notation. So we've got negative infinity to zero and union one to infinity. So let's finish up our steps. So we checked the intervals on the number line using sign analysis and then step five determine which intervals solve the inequality. In other words, if we are, if we have an equation that's greater than zero, we need positive sections if we have an equation that's less than zero, we need negative sections. That's just a little reminder. 
All right, very good. Now let's move on to our rational inequalities. Here we're going to solve this one graphically and then we're going to solve one algebraically. Okay, we're going to do both. So the procedure is similar but not exactly the same. Uh, we've been practicing graphing rationals so hopefully we're fairly comfortable with that. We uh, need to make sure there's a zero. Okay, so no matter what we're doing on any of these, we our first step is to make sure we have a zero on one side. And that's non-negotiable, we have to. That one is a zero, yay. Then if you remember when we're graphing, we factor first to see if there's anything we can cancel out. And we can see that there's no canceling here. Okay, so let's see, where are our asymptotes? So, okay, so we've got um, vertical asymptotes at 2 and negative 2. Here we go, so two, negative 2 and 2. Okay, let's remember about horizontal or slant. This degree is 1. It's smaller than that, so hopefully we recall that means my horizontal asymptote is on the x-axis. All right, so just so that this um, process, the notes are a little bit quicker, I'm going to go ahead and graph. Hopefully you remember the procedures from graphing from the last lesson. If you don't, you can review that lesson. Um, I'm going to find the what are the x-intercept actually. That's where I set the numerator, x minus 1 equal to 0. So. Um, I get x is 1, so it actually crosses here. So my center one looks like this. And then I would plot points like a point at 3 and a point at negative 3. I would do a t chart, and I did, and that gives me one here and one here. Again, I'm just going it quickly so that we can, um, since we've already covered this. So what do I want? I want to be bigger than or equal to zero. That's what I'm wanting. So where is that true? Okay, that's bigger than and that's bigger <clears throat> or equal to zero. So we go, let's see, what is that? Negative two. I can't include negative two because there's a vertical asymptote. I'm going to go to 1. I can include 1 because it's greater than or equal to 0. And it's certainly equal to 0 right here, so that's okay to put that in there. Okay, and let's pick up, let's see, where else? So we pick up at 2, and then we go to infinity. And that is graphing. That would be solving by graphing. All right, last problem. Now we're going to solve algebraically. Okay, um, again, step one, make sure we have a zero on one side, and we don't. So we're going to have to subtract the three over. So I've got 3x squared plus 13x plus 9 over x plus 2 squared minus 3. Now, hopefully you remember when we're adding and subtracting fractions, um, I have to have a common denominator. And my common denominator is x plus 2 squared. So I have to multiply the 3 by x plus 2 squared over x plus 2 squared. Less than equal to 0. Okay, great. Ooh, fractions, adding and subtracting fractions. Doesn't that sound fun? I'm, uh, I'm sure you remember, and you probably just love adding and subtracting fractions. But remember, we have to have common denominators. And we can only multiply by the number 1. Like this is 1, right? The same thing over itself is 1. Um, no fair trying to multiply by something other than 1. We can call a clever form of 1. That's kind of fun. So what do we need to do? We need to basically combine these numerators together. 
That's what we need to do. We need to combine them together so we have one fraction instead of two. Okay, so we've got 3x squared plus 13, 13x plus 9, minus 3 times. So I'm going to foil out the x plus 2 times x plus 2, just a little scratch work right here if we need to visualize it. x plus 2 times x plus 2, that would be x squared plus 2x plus 2x. So x squared plus 4x plus 4. Okay, great, and that's all over our nice little common denominator, and we're less than or equal to zero. Okay, so now, yes, you guessed it, we need to distribute the negative 3. So we've got 3x squared plus 13x plus 9 minus 3x squared minus 12x minus 12 all over x plus 2 squared. Whew, okay, we're making some progress. Now it's combined like terms. So the 3x squared minus 3x squared, that's all gone. That's kind of nice. 13x minus 12x gives me x. And 9 minus 12 gives me a negative 3. So all that craziness boils down to x minus 3 over you know, the common denominator of x plus 2 squared. Whew. Okay. So what do we do? Okay, so let's put make our little notes here. So step 1, uh, 0 on one side. Step 2, add slash subtract to get one fraction. Step three, we want to set the numerator and denominator equal to zero. Then put those numbers on the number line. Okay, I hope you can read my writing. So sorry, it's kind of messy. All right, so if I set the numerator equal to zero, I get a three. If I set the denominator equal to zero, I get a negative two. Um, even though, even though this one allows for or equal to, we can never equal the denominator ever because uh, when the denominator is zero, because we know that's bad, right? We can't do that, that's that's bad. So I, just to remind myself, I'm gonna put a little circle here. That just reminds me that, you know, when I am writing down my solution, I can't include negative two in it. I can't do like a bracket there. That's a no-go. No All right, so what do we do? Well, we're going to have to test the signs. We're gonna do the same thing we did on the other page. We're gonna pick numbers, I'm going to pick a negative 3 here. I'm going to pick 0. I love picking 0. That's fun to work with. And then I'm going to pick 4. Again, doesn't matter which numbers you pick. You can pick any number as long as it's inside the interval. What do we do with that number? What we're going to do is we're going to take that number and we're going to plug it in here and figure out if we get a positive or negative answer. Now nicely, this denominator, I hope we can see that it doesn't matter what number I put right here for x. If I add 2 to it, it doesn't matter because when I square the result, I'm always going to get a positive number. So I really don't even need to worry about the denominator in this particular case because it's squared. If it wasn't squared, then I totally would have to worry about the denominator. So I don't, so I'm just going to work on the numerator. So if I put a negative 3 up here, Okay, so where I'm talking about right in here. Okay, it's going crazy. All right, so here we go. So I'm going to um, put the number in right here where that X is. Again, 
I don't really need to worry about the denominator because it's squared, which is just kind of nice. It doesn't always happen like that, ladies. So negative 3 minus 3, that gives me a negative section. 0 minus 3 gives me a negative section. Okay, and then 4 minus 3 gives me a positive section. Now what do we want? What do we want? We want to be smaller than 0. So where are we smaller than 0? That's smaller than 0, and that's smaller than 0. Okay, so now we can write our answer. Our answer is negative infinity to negative 2. And even though we can equal 0, we know that we can't equal negative 2. We talked about that before. That's a no-no, right? And then hook that together with from negative 2 to 3. Now we can equal 3 because it's 0 at 3. So that's pretty cool. That's okay. And that would be our answer. All right.